My name is Stephen, and I live in the foothills of East Tennessee. I've lived here my entire life. I grew up hearing the stories of mountain trolls, witches, ghosts, skinwalkers, and so many other tales that I can't remember them all. So, I'd heard the stories about the different gods that supposedly lived in the vast mountains too. These gods, well, in the stories, require human sacrifices every so often. Why they require these human sacrifices is not always so clear. And some of the gods help the farmers have abundant crops. Some ensure livestock are healthy and that predators leave them alone. There's even a god that ensures a household's milk, butter, and eggs don't sour. Needless to say, there are mountain gods for almost every aspect of one's life. What I had never done was believe in all those stories. My grandparents, however, believed in those stories and warned me about my irreverence towards them. Grandma told me that one day I'd be sorry for not believing. That one of the gods would grow tired of my mocking and prove his or her existence to me in the most terrible way imaginable. Being the only grandson, I grew up with a sense of being able to get away with more than most kids my age, so I gave little thought to Grandma's warnings. I just enjoyed getting her riled up enough to start fussing at me. I used to tell her that she would have made a good preacher when she'd fuss at me, but <laughs> Grandma didn't find this funny. Now don't get me wrong, I love my grandparents and didn't tease them to be disrespectful. No. I simply didn't believe the way that they did, and if I could get them to think about it enough, they'd see that their beliefs were outdated. They took to my electronics as well as I took to their old folk tales about gods, so we were even. Grandma would tell me she didn't see the sense in the electronic gadgets, and that she'd made out just fine for 70 years without them. Grandpa would laugh at videos I'd show him, but just shake his head when I tried to teach him how to use a tablet. My parents still clung to some of the old beliefs, but did so without drawing attention to it. My mother covered every mirror in the house after deaths. She set a place at dinner twice each year for relatives who had passed away during the last year. She set out saucers of milk, honey, and bread at the appropriate times to appease the forest folk and keep them from playing pranks that might turn cruel. It was little things like this that let me know that they still believed in some of the old ways. And the one time I asked my mother about it though, she adamantly denied it, saying it was just tradition she held to. Like putting up a Christmas tree, hanging mistletoe in the doorway, or baking a ham at Thanksgiving. When I pushed the issue, she became so angry that I dropped the subject. Her anger gave me all the answers I needed. I never was quite brave enough to question my father about his beliefs. He was a gruff and grumpy man at the best of times, and questions were never a good way to approach him if I wanted to have a decent conversation. In my late teenage years, I took up photography. I lived in one of the prettiest places in the world, so why not capture it on film and make some money doing it? And for a couple of years, I was content taking photos of abandoned farms, homes, stores, barns, and the like. I went for several months taking pictures of the people around my area, too. Their features intrigued me, especially in black and white photos. Then, one day, my cousin, her name is Daisy, suggested I take pictures in the mountains, where few people get to see. The idea struck me like a bolt from the sky. Why hadn't I thought of it before? I'd grown up in the mountains. I knew my way around as well as my grandfather did, and he taught me all the trails after all. And stoked on this new idea, I planned out exactly where I'd go and what I would capture on film. People would love this content, especially people who liked the mountains but couldn't visit them for whatever reasons. And leaving before daylight, I took my photography gear and my day's supplies and walked into the woods behind my parents' house. It was high summer, and the forest was already alive with movement. 
The sun crept over the horizon slowly, waking the buzzing insects as it came. Following a path that Grandfather and I had taken countless times as we hunted ginseng over the years, I was in my comfort zone and knew the best places to pause for still shots of the landscape. The vibrant oranges, blues, and purples of the different species of flowers blanketed the sunnier spots and made for some beautiful pictures that I knew my grandmother would love for her collection. I'd been taking landscape shots for her collection ever since I'd received my first camera. She loved to point out the different flowers and tell me about them. And it never failed that she had a story about the healing power of plants. Although, I highly suspected that. She was what the old-timers called a green witch back in her day. I liked the stories, though, so I always listened pretty closely. And, you know what, you never know when such information might come in handy. Before I realized it, I had wandered off the main path. Looking at my surroundings, I couldn't even figure out which way I should walk to get back to the main path. And thinking that I surely couldn't have gone far from it. I picked a direction and started walking. Now unfortunately the landscape changed into a very unfamiliar territory. It was darker. There were no more broad swathes of brightly colored flowers covering the ground. Tree trunks were darker, shorter, twisted instead of the tall, sturdy, healthy ones that I was used to seeing. I was a bit worried and turned to walk in the opposite direction. Surely, I would come back to the spot where I'd first realize I'd gone off the main trail. But I didn't. The mountain seemed to be changing with intent as I walked. The leaves were nearly black and the sun didn't penetrate as far through the canopy of leaves in this part of the woods. The grass thinned and eventually disappeared completely, leaving only dark soil and rocks underfoot and a putrid smell permeated the air and hung thickly, gagging me. Now, my phone's GPS didn't work on the mountain, but I'd had no illusion that it would. My compass, however, did work, and I'd set a course down the mountain that would lead me out of the woods and into a county park. Screw the pictures. There were always other days to get pictures, I just wanted out of that smell and out of that creepy section of woodland I'd never seen before. And soon, I'd noticed that no animals scurried around, no birds sang, and no crows cawed overhead. When the breeze stopped, the only sound in the forest was my own labored breathing. And that never happens. There is always noise in the forest. Checking my compass for the zillionth time, I headed for a ravine, thinking I could follow it for a while and cut some time off my travel. As I reached the bottom of the deep ravine, I got the distinct feeling that I was being watched by someone. Not an animal, but a person. The fine hairs on my neck stood up, and I looked around, and I saw no one. But a story my grandma had told me came to my mind. She said there were people who still lived in the deepest parts of the mountains who never came out. These people lived off the land. They grew their gardens, hunted deer, rabbits, bear, and they still lived by the old laws, which meant that they still sacrificed people at least once every year to the god that protected them and ensured there was enough game to feed them all. This was a particularly terrible god as he served several purposes. No saucer of honey would suit this god. Grandma always said that these people snatched lone hikers instead of sacrificing one of their own community members. She also told me that their territory was dark, dank, scary, and foul-smelling. No birds would sing there. Flowers would grow there because the ground was tainted by so much human blood. Now, I tried to tell myself that I didn't hear stealthy footsteps at the top of the ravine as I walked, that they didn't stop when I stopped, and that grandma's stories were just stories to scare me into not wandering off when I was a kid. 
but none of that worked. I did hear footsteps behind and above me. I fought off the panic for another minute. Then I broke and ran for the mouth of the ravine, which was maybe 200 feet ahead of me. My brain was telling me grandma's story was bullshit. My heart was telling me that it was the truth and that one of those crazy people were chasing me. The mouth of the ravine loomed about 50 feet in front of me when something hard hit the back of my head. The world tipped sideways and went black. Consciousness swam back to me in waves. I heard voices that were jumbled and felt I was being dragged over rough ground. And then I was out again. Somewhere in the blackness, I could hear my grandma telling me to get up, fight the darkness, and run for my life. I struggled, and my vision tried to clear. But everything was blurry like looking through grease-smeared glass. The voices were clearer. But I still couldn't make out words. As I grasped that reality, my head throbbed and something warm trickled down the back of my neck. Then, many hands grasped at me at wrists and ankles, hoisting me up onto a wooden platform only to let me thump unceremoniously onto it. It knocked the breath out of me, but succeeded in bringing everything back into sharp focus. Before I could scramble off the wooden platform, a man, twice my size, seized my hair and dragged me backward. I thrashed at his arms, but it was like thrashing at tree trunks for all the good it did. He stood easily seven feet tall, and was half that broad across the shoulders. The grimace on his face showed that he was missing many teeth and his skin was weathered like that of a man who had spent most of his life outdoors. He attached a leather band around my throat, securing me to a tall pole in the center of the platform. He tethered my hands to my ankles with rope, in fluid, precise motions that said he'd done this before. I tried to tell him my name, and he kicked me in the ribs. I could see people on the ground below the platform, maybe two dozen or so men and women and children. They milled about, staring up at me with wide eyes and speaking in low tones to each other as they went about their business. A boy, probably about ten, climbed the steps up to the platform. He held a tomato in his hand and was grinning. He cast furtive glances around below him. I saw no one down there and thought he'd come up to offer help, or at the very least, food. Can you help me? Untie me, please. I need to go home. This is a terrible mistake. I tried to stage whisper to him as I smiled, you know, trying to be non-threatening as possible. He moved toward me, hunkering down at my feet, rolling the tomato in his hands still grinning. Ain't no mistake. He reached out and poked my leg just below the knee. You'll fetch us a good season of game. Darnell did real good. He started to back away. No, no, please untie me. Then I held out my hands. But the boy shook his head. Terragot gets you, mister. You'll be happy too. He turned and leaped from the platform. I watched with sinking hope as he ran toward a little shack a few hundred feet away from me. I didn't know who this Terragot was, and I didn't think I wanted to know. I struggled against the rope at my wrists and succeeded in bringing the blood to the surface. Then I waited for someone else to walk by. I planned on yelling to anyone to help me. No one else came by until late that evening, when the sun was setting. The shadows grew long and stretched out over the land in my little raised platform. From one of the shadows appeared a little old woman. She stood the same height as the little boy from earlier, and her back was badly bent. All her hair had gone white. The wrinkles on her face were deep like the ravines on the face of a mountain. Her movements were stilted and shaky, but her eyes were sharp and clear. 
she offered me a cup with warm liquid in it. Drink. It'll help with the fear and the pain when Terragot gets here. She looked over her shoulder and then back at me. Oh, it won't be long now. She gave a tiny, short laugh. I sipped the liquid, but it set off my gag reflex and I spat it on the boards, and her offended expression lasted only a second. You'll regret that. She backed away and pointed toward the woods. He's coming. Who's coming? Let me go. Why are you even doing this? I don't even know you. I flailed at my restraints again. And in a sing-songy voice, she said, Terragotti is coming. She kept repeating that until she was out of my sight again. And I yelled for help until my throat was sore and no one answered. Full dark came to the mountains, and only light was the pinpricks of starlight in the black sky. I had been working at the rope around my wrists with my teeth since the old woman left, and had succeeded in chewing through a fraction of it. If I couldn't loosen it or chew through it before Terry got appeared, I was screwed. I had the creeping feeling that this was the truth in one of my grandmother's stories. This was a village where they still believed in human sacrifice. But what I couldn't figure out was, what were they going to sacrifice me to? Maybe they were going to feed me to a wild animal, because, well, I didn't believe in gods roaming the woods. And then as I continued to chew through the rope, the putrid smell of rot that I had smelled in the woods drifted to me. My eyes watered. It was much stronger than it had been earlier, and an ear-piercing shriek tore through the darkness on my left. Whatever made the sound was still quite far away. I chewed at the rope until my gums ached and bled, and then I chewed at it harder. People moved about, and suddenly, there were lights. Lanterns on poles being erected through the platform. I could see the rope and all the blood on it from my mouth. I had almost torn through enough that I could slip free. And then there was another shriek, but this time, much closer. A collective gasp ran through the gathered crowd, and I heard them running away. The trees nearest the platform shook, and leaves fell to the ground. The lantern pole there crashed to the ground, and a blaze jumped to life at the corner of the platform, and my heart raced. A beast roughly the size of an elephant burst through the tree line and rushed toward the steps, stopping its approach only because of the blaze. Its face was three in one, wolf, bear, and mountain lion, the three largest predators we have in the mountains here. The amalgam hurt my eyes to look upon it. The faces seemed as if they had been made of wax and melted together with imperfect proportions that produced a five-eyed, two-mouthed, six-eared horror that my brain could barely perceive as real. The smell of decay and rot was so strong that I couldn't draw breath for a full thirty seconds. The beast tossed its head and reared up, kicking four of its legs at the fire and bellowing in rage. Some of its eyes rolled toward me, and it screamed again. I pulled at the remainder of the rope with my teeth so hard that a front tooth snapped off, and I slipped my hands and feet from the rope and struggled to find the clasp on the neckband. The fire spread to the steps and engulfed the side of the platform. The beast, worked into a frenzied, circled the platform, and it tried several times to jump onto the platform, but couldn't due to its malformation and large size. Its shaggy and matted fur caught fire near its head, and it rammed into the platform's support until the fire was out. And I took the opportunity to grab the nearest lantern and run towards the fire. And the beast gave chase, and I put the blaze between us. Worked into a fury, it finally bolted through the fire at me, and I ran for the woods, and I kept running until I heard the screams and shrieks from the beast fading behind me. And hiding behind a boulder, I risked the peak. 
The beast's fur had caught on fire as it ran through the blaze at me, and there were a handful of smaller blazes springing up in the forest where I had just run through. I could see one larger blaze moving away to the right. It was that beast, running blindly and burning. And so I ran until I reached the bottom of the mountain. I have not gone back into the woods since then, and, well... I'm seriously considering moving somewhere that doesn't have mountains.